Zoom recording. There we go. Sweet. Well, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be teaching you all about networking and APIs. I'm really excited about it. So just as a quick background, I've been teaching with Careers in Code for, I think this is my fourth cohort now. So it's been uh, kind of fun, and I enjoy doing it each time. I've taught the same sort of thing each time. It's like the thing I always teach. So get to go through sort of the same thing uh, again each cohort, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and Mel was one of my students way back. So he's very familiar with this stuff and can answer questions. So yeah, sweet. Um, let me share my screen here. OK. Um, can you all see my screen? Sweet. I am going to, uh, OK, let's go to careers in code. Uh, no, the cohort four channel, this one. Sweet. So I have a presentation here. Um, it should be a link that everyone can access. The way I've structured this is sort of one big presentation for the whole two weeks, not like individual presentations per day. It's just a little bit easier for me to do it that way. And it's sort of split up into sections. So we're just sort of going to slowly work through the, the big, large presentation over the course of the two weeks. Um, but feel free to, to, oh, yep, and you're all are already looking at it. Great. Um, cool. So today we're going to be sort of starting off this uh, this module with networking fundamentals. And I guess to start here, I want to talk about what is networking. So networking is the process of taking mul different uh, multiple computers and connecting them together so they can communicate with each other. Really, like networking is sort of what powers the internet. And behind the scenes, really all it is is just a bunch of a bunch of cables connected to a bunch of computers, and those computers send messages to each other through those cables. And today we're going to sort of do a really high level overview of what's going on there, how the computers actually send data to each other. And hopefully by the end of the class, we'll have you sort of sending some of your own messages too. Um, cool. Now, I, uh, I wanted to come up with an analogy here to sort of help explain how this works. And the analogy I came up with is the postal service. So imagine you sort of uh, have like a, a street. And on that street, you have a bunch of houses. And each house has an address and each house has like a little driveway. Like think like typical sort of suburban style like housing development here. You've got our nice road down the middle. Um, and if you want to send mail from one house to another, well, oh, yeah, if you want to send mail from one house to another, like, that's uh, this is sort of the analogy I'm going to be trying to go towards here for like uh, how computers communicate with each other. And in general here, like the, uh, the this this postal service concept, like the actual service you use, the postal service, like the sort of uh, the sort of process of sending mail on the internet. The sort of analogy for that is something called TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, and this is sort of what the computers use behind the scenes to actually send that data from one computer to another. And I also should say, like, this is a little bit of a simplification, but for, for uh, at least for careers in code, this is going to be good enough. Um, when a computer sort of initiates a connection to another computer, that's what's called a TCP socket. So think about, like, you want to send that letter. You sort of initiate that connection, you can send whatever you want, and then sort of you terminate that connection. And that's sort of like the entire sort of life cycle of sending data from one computer to another computer on the internet. So TCP is kind of like the postal service system. And it's the sort of that process of facilitate sending mail. So like walking through sort of an example here, let's say we want to send a letter from 100 Oak Street to 103 Oak Street. And this is gonna probably seem pretty obvious, but just wanna sort of put it out there, make sure it's, it's very clear to everybody. So what would happen here? Well, you'd have like a little piece of mail and be, be at one of the houses. And then you'd get that, a little postal service worker would come along and would pick up that mail and would bring it over to the house and drop it off. And that's how you'd sort of transmit data from one house to another house. So. The key thing here is all the streets. These are sort of like the cables that make up the internet. The messages are sort of going through those, going through the streets, going through the cables to make it from one place to another. 
Cool. Okay. So we're going to basically, for the whole first part of this class, build on this analogy and sort of try to make it match to the best of my understanding how the internet works. So the first bit of, uh, the first thing we're going to add is uh, one complexity. So how does the Postal Service know where to send your letter? And the answer is probably pretty obviously an address. So every house you notice there had an address and it indicates where sort of in the road network or I guess in the internet network, if we're gonna go crazy with our analogies here, that house or computer is located. And similarly, every computer has an address and it's called an IP address. Um, IP addresses are unique. So every computer uh, on the internet, for the most part, has a unique IP address. IP addresses are, are a little complex, but the, for what we're going to be talking about today and for the rest of this, this module and the rest of careers in code, all you need to know is that IP addresses sort of are formatted with four numbers with dots in between. So, and there will be three digit numbers or two digit or one digit numbers. Um, so, so here's some examples like 192.168.1.24. What those numbers mean, that isn't really all that important. You can just think of that as itself like a unique identifier that you can use to say, oh, that computer is located there. Just like you may say like 123 Oak Street, that's an address. You can try to pick it apart and be like, oh, it's on this street. And you can do that. But at the end of the day, it's sort of like a text string. It's like an address. And that sort of points to where that, that house or computer is located. And also, I'm just going to keep rolling through until people interrupt me if they have questions. So. I'm 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 totally cool with being interrupted here. Sweet. So let's update our model. Let's make this a little bit more realistic. Let's move away from the houses and go towards more of the computers here. So I've replaced all the houses with computers. And now instead of having like plain text addresses, we've got IP addresses. So there's sort of four numbers with dots in between them. You also notice that they all start with sort of the same thing. This is sort of something you'll notice as we sort of get into this a bit more that often IP addresses that are sort of near each other in the internet sort of are similar. Um, in particular, this 192.168 thing is going to come up a lot. Um, so I've got 192.168.1.100, 192.168.1.101, 102, and 103. So those are my sort of four computers that are on this network. Cool. Okay, the next bit of complexity. Computers can have multiple what are called network address or network interfaces, excuse me. Um, and what a network interface sort of is, it's like a way by which the computer can connect to the internet. Usually a network interface is, a, is sort of separated by technology. So let's say you've got a laptop and you've got it plugged in with like an internet cable, like an ethernet cable. And you've also got it connected to Wi-Fi. That laptop will actually have most of the time um, two, two IP addresses two sort of addresses you can use to talk to it. Um, usually when we talk about network interfaces, they sort of ha each have their own little name. So they'll look like EN0 or WN0 or ETH0 or HAM0. We're gonna talk about this in a moment, but each interface sort of has a name um, and each interface has its own IP address. So if we sort of keep extending this, mo extending this model a bit here, Imagine that all of our computers or houses, or I'm kind of going to have to use these interchangeably here, sorry, but uh, imagine we have each a house or a computer with multiple driveways. So multiple sort of entrances. So you sort of got like the front door and the side door. And if you want to send a letter to that house, if those two like doors have different addresses, you can sort of send it to either address. It's still going to end inside of the house and enter inside of the house. It's just sort of which way you want to go in. In other words, do you want that message to go over the cable or do you want it to go over Wi-Fi? So you also notice as part of this, we've now got 100, 101, 102, 103. We also now have 104. So we now have, uh, we now have five IP addresses instead of four like before. Okay, this is sort of the first fun part where we all get to do something together. Um, we are going to have you all figure out the IP address of your computer. And I'm assuming you're all on the internet because you're on this video call right now. Um, I really hope that's a good assumption. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through this here and I'd like if everybody else could do it too. Um, 
if you're not on your careers in code Mac, you're probably going to have trouble with this. I'm sort of assuming you all are. So if you aren't on your Mac, you might not be able to do it right now and you might have to do it later on. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a terminal. Okay. And once this sort of is ready and done loading, I'm going to type one a command into it. If config, all one word, all lowercase. And if you're following along with me in the slides, sort of we'll instruct you through that. And I'm going to hit enter. What you're going to see is a bunch of sort of text in here. And we're going to talk about what some of this text means. But uh, before I, I go forward, uh, I'm going to give everybody a second to, to do that. Um, once you've been able to successfully do it, if you could put like a little reaction in Zoom to sort of let me know, maybe like, a, oh gosh, I forgot what all the reactions are. Um, I don't know, like a, yeah, a thumbs up. Perfect. <laughs> I should mention, I'm not really a Zoom expert. And Max always blows me out of the water with this stuff. So I apologize. This is going to be a little stumbling. <laughs> cool. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, How do I get that little squiggly thing, that upside down Y? Oh, yeah. Uh, that is a customization I have on my local machine um, that I sort of decided to make. Uh, you probably are going to see something that looks a little longer and probably all white. Um, if you're curious, I'll post a link in the Slack channel after the class to show you how you can configure that differently if you want. Okay. Could I please look at the command again? Yep. Thank you. And Ryan, where do we where do we paste this? Do we have to create a new file? If you create a new terminal, so if you uh, you go to like applications, go to terminal. I'm assuming you know you know about the terminal and know how to open that up. Um, you probably can also do it in the terminal in VS Code as well if you're more familiar with that. And just type ifconfig and hit enter, all lowercase. Um, Karen, if you hit option command spacebar, um, the spotlight will search will show up. Put terminal in there, press enter, and it will show up. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Well, I saw a, bu a bunch of thumbs up. Um, unless anyone wants me to hold off a little longer, I'm probably going to keep moving forward. Sounds good? Okay, cool. So we're going to take a look at sort of this if config output here. Um, you'll notice on the left, there's a bunch of sort of text with before the colon. Um, Karen, I think my uh, audio might be coming through with you, on you, so I'm going to mute you if you don't mind. Um, but uh, you'll you'll notice before. Oops, wait a second. I'm going to minimize my other terminal sitting there. Look what's going on there. Um, there's all these things, and you might be noticing sort of from the previous slide, each of these kind of matches the format I was showing before for network interfaces. And if you guess these are each of your network interfaces, you would be right. Um, I probably have more in my list than you probably do. But the one, the two that I want you to clue in on are LO0, that's probably at the top or near the top, and then EN0. Um, most likely, you should have both. Um, if you don't, post a message in this chat or something just to, just to check, just so I know. Um, but I think you should have both. I have an NP0, ANPI0. ANPI0. Uh, yeah. Do you yeah. have a EN0 as well, or just that? I have the LO0, but I don't have the EN0. In place of that is the um, ENPI0, and then after that is the EN3, EN4, EN1, EN2. Schneider, my EN0. Oh, uh, my EN0. Oh, do you have an go. EN1 maybe instead? This is, yeah, this is always an, a bit... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, I have the, I found it. It was just way further down. Okay, yeah. They may not be in as nice of an order as I have here. Um, cool. 
So the thing that I want to point out that's most important in all this, because you're probably looking at this and you're like, what the heck does all this mean? This is just so much text. And I'll be honest that I don't even know what a lot of this means. I sort of know like the bits I care about and I can pull them out. Um, the thing that, that I want to clue you in on, on, though, is under each network interface, there's a line that says INET. And right after that, you have what looks like an IP address. And what you'll notice is LO0, the IP address is 127.0.0.1. Mm -hmm. And then EN0, the IP address under INET will be something kind of like this. And if you find this, congratulations, you found your IP address. What if you don't? What if you don't? Um, I have it. Oh, EN0. Nope, I got it. Cool. I had to yeah. make it bigger. There should be an EN0 in there somewhere. Um, Artrell, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I have. I can find it with my LO0, but not with my EN0. My EN0 doesn't have it. However, when I go to it below my EN0, I have, um, what is it? I have a C, S, U, N, then I have a D, then an R, Y, but nothing under the EN0 that shows my, my internet mm -hmm. protocol address. If you, uh, if you look through all your network interfaces, if you look under the INET, do any of them have an INET field with an IP, what looks like an IP address there? It's possible you've got a different network interface that's active. Um, or alternatively, if you post a screenshot or a, a, a snapshot of what you have in, in chat or something like that, I can take a look and see if I can find it. I can share my screen real quick. Yeah, that would work too. Perfect. All right. Um, hold on one second. All right. Can you see it now? So I here's can. my. my okay. Board. If you scroll down a bit, what do you see? Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, scroll up a bit more. Yep. EN0. Yep. There you go. But I don't see the, I don't see the, the address in here, though. Uh, go down a few more lines. Um, Is right all of this right here a part of it? Yep. All of that is a part of uh, it. Ah, okay. Yeah, it, your IP address is 192.168.1.208. Right here? Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Sweet. I'm going to assume people largely have had success. If not, uh, feel free to reach out to me or Mel, and we can try to help you out. Cool. Yeah, so there's a lot more information in here, but we're not going to need to talk about it for the rest of the class. Um, if you're curious, though, maybe in like an office hours this weekend, we can go more into certain things if folks want to know. Um, oh, yeah. OK, well, we just did this. I thought it, I didn't realize I had this slide. Well, OK. Um, yeah, so makes sense. I already asked that. I'm ahead here. Cool. OK, so what do these two interactive interfaces do? LO0 is what's called the local loopback interface. We're going to talk about that briefly. We mentioned that EN0 is sort of your main network interface, most likely your Wi-Fi interface. So the way it works on Macs is sort of you have all these EN interfaces, and it tends to be that the first network interface you have gets assigned EN0, the next one EN1. So like if you were to plug an Ethernet cord in your, in your laptop, you'd probably get an EN1 with another IP address. But the local loopback is kind of exciting, and this is, allows us to add another thing to our conceptual model. So the local loopback interface allows a computer to make a request to itself. And you might be wondering why this is a helpful concept. Like, why would a computer want to talk to itself? And it turns out this actually comes in quite handy sometimes. For example, let's say you sort of want to send a message to yourself to test something. Like, that's a great example where you might need to send a message to yourself. Um, but what you can think about this local loopback interface as is like sort of like a back path or like a driveway that goes from the computer back to itself again. And you'll notice that the IP address for each of those for every computer is 127.0.0.1. And that's a really like special IP address. That is an IP address that every computer 
like if a computer makes a request to that address, it means send message to me. That's the only sort of IP address that you can use that local loopback mechanism to, to make a request with. You also notice that that LO0 interface doesn't go down to the main road, it sort of goes back to the house. So you can't, uh, this computer on the left here can't make a request to this computer on the right here, LO0 interface. The only thing that can make a request to that interface is the computer itself. Like I can make a request to mine, you can make a request to yours, we can't make a request to each other's. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but we we're going to be utilizing this LO0 interface a little bit later today to do some of our uh, our exercises. Cool. It might a quick question. Yeah. It might be something you're you're getting to, but could you maybe give an example of why a computer will want to make a request from itself? Yeah. So I think the example I mentioned before is is a good one where like maybe you want to send a message to yourself to test something. Another great example that you might have noticed, and we're going to get to in a moment here, when you use that VS Code uh, like lot like local development server thing, I forget what it's called. I don't use VS Code on a daily basis, but and sort of it allows you to view your your code in your web browser. What you're doing there is your web browser, and we're going to get to this later on in the in the module. But as a preview, like your web browser is making a request to your local computer, a server that's running on your local computer, which is sending data back to your web browser. So that's a great example where that's using that LO0 interface to sort of allow you to make a request to yourself. Okay, yeah, and I did, I, I missed the connection before. That, that was a good example that you used before. All right, that's my bad. No problem. Um, cool, okay, next, uh, next complexity here. We're gonna talk about what's called DNS. Um, like everything I'm talking about today, I'm sort of scratching the surface of each of these topics. And I'm gonna do the same thing with DNS. DNS is sort of a way you can assign like a human readable name to an IP address. Also help if I knew how to spell sometimes. Um, so you can think of a, a DNS as like a big table with two columns, one of them having like a name and one of them having an IP address. And if you want to, let's say, make a request to somebody, you can look up their IP address in this big table and be like, oh, I want to make a request to them. And then you can sort of, given their name, figure out their IP address, and now you know where to send their mail effectively. Um, I should also mention there is a DNS entry that is present on, I think, every system, at least every system I've ever encountered, called localhost. Localhost maps to 127.0.0.1. So if you've looked at that VS Code live share thing, you've seen on your web browser, like localhost colon something, that localhost means use 127.0.0.1, which means use a local loopback, which means make a request to yourself effectively. Um, so we're gonna uh, add this DNS concept to our sort of map here that we've been working with today. So we're gonna add a little table down here in the corner. And the, our table sort of has a bunch of different names smith.com, jones.com, johnson.com. I figured if they're going to be assigned to houses, they should have like family last names or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and I'm also going to update some of these to sort of have these DNS entries. So smith.com here, 192.168.1.100. So that's sort of this row down here in the table. And sort of I've copied all those DNS entries over to the right spots. Now, I want to call out, though, that not every IP address has a DNS entry, and that's totally fine. In fact, more often than not, like, you might just have a computer that's just sort of, like, not really, you don't really need to talk to it. It's only ever, like, talking to other people. Your laptops are great examples. Well, your laptop doesn't really have, like, a DNS name because no one's making requests to it. It's, so for that reason, like, it's where you'll find these computers that have DNS names are things like servers out on the web. For example, like you go to a website, the thing that's running that behind the scenes, that most, so it's almost certainly has a DNS name because you're going to it in the web browser when you sort of navigate to it. Um, and in addition, we also got to add local hosts to all our 127.0.0.1 local loopback bits here. But yeah, and that's sort of, uh, that's sort of DNS. And, DNS is going to become important later on today because we're going to be doing an exercise where we got to talk to a server that's out on the internet somewhere and you got to know where to talk to where to talk to it. It's got a DNS name. Make sense? 
seeing lots of head shaking. That's great. Okay. Ports. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about today to add to our conceptual map. Ports are sort of a way uh, by which you can uh, you can route a message to a particular process running on a computer, or in our house analogy, a person living in the house. Um, just some like technical details, though. Ports are numbers. It's a number from zero to six five five three five, and the reason why it's bounded to that is a very specific computery reason that doesn't really matter for this, but it's bounded within that. Um, and it's sort of like the channel in which you want to communicate on, the person you want to talk to in the house, the process you want to talk to running on the computer. Um, it tends to be that ports are assigned based off the type of communication you want to have. So if you want to send a like type of data X, that might always be on port one. And type of data Y might always be on port two. And those standards mean that you can send data on that port to any computer and sort of like that port, sort of the port it expects it, the communication to be on. Um, it's sort of a nice standard. And there's a, sort of a list of like these ports that are published, which we'll probably get to later on in the module. But usually those ports that are sort of predefined, those are under 1,024. So sort of that subset, that 0 to 1,024 range is like each of those is sort of defined for a type of communication. Most of them at least are. And then everything from 1,024 to all the way to 65535, those are all ports you can just pick arbitrarily. Think of them like TV channels. You can sort of like transmit on whatever one you want. doesn't really matter. But those ones under 1,024 tend to have like defined uses, and you don't just want to like arbitrarily use those for whatever data you're sending. So we're going to add uh, ports to our concept here, our, our crazy analogy thing, by saying that if you're sending data to this computer right here or this house right here or whatever, the analogy is starting to get a little loaded at this point. Um, we have two people that live at this house, Bob and Susie. And if a package goes to the house, Bob gets the package. If a letter goes to the house, Susie gets the letter. And the sort of two different types of mail or two different types of communications that are nicely segmented based off the person who's receiving them. So let's go through a bit of a role-playing exercise here. We've got a TCP packet, sort of a message we want to send on the internet. And we've got a destination, which is smith.com. So sort of that DNS address, DSS name. The type of data we have, this is a letter. And it's got some data in it, some contents, which is some uh, arbitrary uh, placeholder Latin text that's popular amongst uh, people in web development. So what happens is sort of you, uh, that packet gets sent on the internet and sort of has to find its way out to wherever it's going. And it knows that it needs to send it to 192.168.1.100, that one, because it looked up in the DNS entry and it was like, oh, smith.com, that's going to 192.168.1.100. So sort of start sending it in that direction. It sort of travels along the internet and eventually arrives at the EN0 interface of this computer. EN0, because that's the IP address assigned to that network interface. 102.168.1.100. The computer sort of analyzes the packet and it says, oh, this is a letter. So it goes to Suzy. And that's kind of how the internet works. Um, I'm brushing over a lot of complexity, of course, but like it's good enough. This model will sort of get you through, I think, for a while. Um, okay. Any any questions before I move on? Cool. So far. Oh yeah. No, not so far. Thanks. Sweet. Okay. Now we get to the fun part. We get to send some messages. So we're going to be sending and receiving messages using a tool called Netcat. This is a terminal-based tool. It's actually a very old tool. It was made in like the 70s or 80s. It's been around for a very long time. And what effectively it is, it's a tool where you can give it a IP address and a port, and you can type text into it. And every single time you type a line and you hit enter, it will send a packet to that IP and that port with that sort of data that you typed in, in that packet. And then if you get data coming back to you, it'll sort of give you the a next line, which is like a response. So where this, what this is kind of nice for is we can sort of send data back and forth between different people, different terminals effectively, and sort of 
be able to see kind of like visually data flowing from one place to another place. So the, we're going to, uh, this is another one of those exercises where I, I'm, I'm hoping we can do it together. Uh, if nothing else, you can watch me do it, but I think ideally everyone can do it on their own too. So we're going to use Netcat to send data to ourselves. We're going to talk to ourselves. And the reason why we're going to talk to ourselves is in a remote environment like this, it's very hard to sort of get to actually like have people communicate from each their computer to another student's computer. And it's because one of the big things I left out in my internet sort of explanation is there's a lot of security in play to ensure that you can't sort of make requests arbitrarily to other people. And that could be a whole crazy discussion of its own. And I, it, but what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, in effect, we can't do quite the idealized version of this. And the easiest way to do this in a remote setting is just to have us talk to ourselves. Um, if we were in person, it might be doable to, to talk to each other, but we're not. So I'm going to walk through this. Um, I'll go through it. And then uh, I'd love for you all if you could try it yourself and see if you can get it to work. OK. So for this, you're going to need two terminals. I think I'm just going to make two tabs in my terminal here. It's probably going to be the easiest way to do this. OK. So there are two things I need to do. I need to start with called a client and a server. I think I've probably used these terms a few times without fully defining them though. So let me just do that quickly here. So typically a client is sort of the person initiating the communication. They're sort of the person sending out the initial letter. A server is someone who's waiting for letters to arrive. And most, most likely once that socket is open, the server could respond back with its own messages, sort of go back through the other way again. But the important thing is when you initially make a connection, it always goes from client to server. So what that means is if you wanna make a connection, the server has to be running before you run the client. Like you sort of have to have someone waiting to catch the thing before you throw the thing. And if you throw the thing without someone ready to catch it, it's just gonna kind of like land on the ground. So, and I sort of walk through this step-by-step step in the instructions here. So if you're watching this recording later on or something and you wanna follow through, feel free to go through the, the instructions in the presentation. But um, before yep. you continue, sorry, I'm yeah. on my terminal. I try to open another one, but it won't let me open another terminal. So how can I, just like you did up here, how can I add two tabs to it? Yeah, so you can do one of two things. If you can hit Command N, that should open a new terminal, or you can hit Command T and it should open a new tab. Okay, let's do Command Alternatively, if you go up to the shell menu in the upper left-hand corner, there's a new window and a new tab option. Mm -hmm. You can go with either of those. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to start by starting the server, and Netcat can act as both a client and a server. So in order to make Netcat act as a server, I'm going to run this command right here. So I'm going to run uh, nc-l5678 and hit enter. Okay, then I'm going to do the other one. I'm going to go to my second terminal. So I've got my server running right now. I'm going to run the client. So I'm going to go nc 127.0.0.1.5678. I'm going to hit enter. Uh, Naj, I think you've got your hand raised. Um, mine says port range not valid. Port range not valid. Can you enter the, the first one? The NC dash L5678. Hmm, okay. Can you share your screen? Curious to see what's going on. Yes. Same thing. Same thing. Oh, I wonder if there's some crazy new Mac security thing I didn't know about. That could be exciting. We'll figure it out though. Oh, wait. Oh, uh, NC dash L, but put the dash and the L together. Don't put a space in between them. Okay. I bet if you do that, it'll work. Hmm. Mine was actually different. Yeah. Uh, if you want to share your screen, you're welcome to. Yeah. 
said I had an invalid option. I'll say in general, with all the stuff we're going to be doing this module with NC, um, you need to be very cautious to type everything exactly right. Like capitalization is important. Like spacing, it's just sort of like JavaScript where sort of it's very detail oriented. And if you miss something or slightly misspell something, it's going to sort of not work. And this is going to like, I've taught this module a few times now, and I can just tell you this is a, a stumbling block a lot of people tend to have. In your case here, uh, Jennifer, you want uh, you have dash one, it looks like, not dash L. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if you do NC dash, and it's lowercase L, I should be clear too. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Cool. Okay. Let me get my terminal back up here. So I've now got both of these running. So now over in my client, the one where I'm doing NC127001, 5678, I'm gonna just type a message. So I'm gonna type like, hello world. And I'm gonna hit enter. And once I hit enter, if I go over here, I see the message showed up. Hey, that's cool, isn't it? Um, then over in my server, I'm gonna type, type uh, hello back. Come back over here, we get hello back. And that should, uh, I, I uh, hope that works for everybody. I'm, I'm pretty confident it will, but uh, if you have problems, let me know. Effectively though, what we're doing here is we're sending data across the internet. It's maybe only along that LO0 thing, but we're sending data from sort of one thing to another thing. It's going across the internet. I don't know, I think it's kind of cool, but maybe I'm weird. Now it's cool, I just don't fully understand it yet. That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> so I'm supposed to see what I wrote in one to in, in the other one. Yeah, you should, do you not? <laughs> no. Hmm, okay. Uh, Arshel, you have your hand raised. I can, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, I um, my Zoom call dropped out for a little bit, um, but I was able to put in the the NC dash um, L5678, that populated, but I don't know what to do next. I can share my screen if you need me to. Yeah, real quick, if you open up another terminal and then put in this command, and just type a thing in this command, you should see it in the, show up in the other one. Okay, so open up another terminal, then put in. If you go to slide uh, 52 in the presentation as well, I've got it sort of laid out in there. So it's just sort of step-by-step -step instructions that you can follow that are sort of this, what I just sort of said, but just written down. Okay, I'll give that a shot. Cool. Um, can everybody give a reaction if they've had success? If you haven't had success, then that's fine. I'm sorry, I must have missed it. Where are we reacting at? Uh, just in Slack. I, I just want to get an idea of how many people have had success and how many people haven't. It seems like a decent number of people still haven't. And that's fine. Okay, reacting to like to what in Slack? Oh, I'm sorry if this was like if this, is it like the post that you made before with no? The I'm or? I'm saying uh, react in in Zoom. Just give me a, or or just tell me has it is it working? Is it not working? Like I I want everyone to it's, be successful. Yeah. It's it's, <laughs> it's working you? for me. Cool, cool. Um, if you're not having success, uh, let me let me know. I I want to uh, because most likely if you're not having success, someone else is having the same problem. Well, I'm not. Can I share my screen again? Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Okay, so you have that one. Mm -hmm. um, I've got this one. Oh, uh, hit enter. And then go back to over to your other one. There you go. 
Oh, geez. So okay. You've got to hit enter for it to sort of send that letter. You, you sort of like wrote up your letter, but didn't actually put it into the mailbox yet. Okay. That was easy. Cool. Uh, Jordan, you've got your hand raised. Mine is not working for some reason. Sure. You want to share your screen? Uh, okay. 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 Ah, so you typed a uppercase NC, and it looks like you used a dash one and not a dash L. So if uh, you do all lowercase NC dash L five, six, seven, eight. And then go back into your other terminal. And then uh, you just hit up and hit enter. Or yeah, that works too. You can type it all out again. Um, one, one little hint. Well, after you type the NC command, you should see that your little prompt, the thing where, at least for Jordan, it says like Jordy at Jordan's air, like that shouldn't show up. It should sort of be like empty. And that's a good sign that it's working. Cool. Now, if you type, uh, just type something in there and hit enter, you should see it show up in the other one. Hey, there we go. Sweet. All right, thank you so Thank you so much. No I don't problem. know if I'm working on oh, There we go. Yeah, so, so generally seems like the, just like being very careful that you sort of transpose things correctly. Might be my monospace font here that's not the best. And if so, I can make corrections on that in the future. But yeah, it's it's really important to sort of get the capitalization, the the exact letters, the spacing, all that right. It's sort of just like JavaScript in that way, at least. I know I said we weren't doing JavaScript for these first few days, but some of these same philosophies are going to come into play, unfortunately. Cool. Okay, I'm going to keep moving forward unless uh, anybody has any further questions. Oh, uh, Artrell, sorry, I didn't realize you had your hand raised. Yeah, no problem. I, Yeah, I need some help. You need some help? Cool. Share your screen. Let's take a look. Okay. Um, I just need you to stop, stop, oh. stop sharing real quick. Sorry. All right. Let me lower my hand, share my screen. All right. So on this one, I... I did the NC space dash L5678. And over here, I did the NC127.0.0.15678. But this yep. is. Yeah, you're you're really close. So if you go over to your first terminal again, you want dash L space. All right, let me try it again. NC... So NC space dash L space 5678. Yeah, there you go. Now, if you go back over to your other terminal and run the other command, it should be good. Cool. Yeah, so if you type a thing, you should see it show up in the other one. Thank you. Wait. No problem. OK. I'm going to keep moving forward then, unless anybody has any more questions. It doesn't look like so. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to quickly talk about sort of the pieces of those commands, just to sort of explain what's going on, because we're going to be using Netcat a bit for these first two days. And I just want to make sure you sort of have an understanding of what this, what this command is really doing here. So Netcat takes a bunch of sort of flags. Um, how familiar are you folks with the command line? Have you sort of used command line tools before all that much with like flags and parameters? Mm -mm. Okay. So you've uh, you've used your term, you've probably run like node in your terminal before, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So node's an example of a command line program. Um in general, it's a uh, it's a pro a, a command that you sort of can run this program in your terminal and you type out a command, sort of a sequence of characters that sort of is split up into like sections. And the first section of that, that thing you type is sort of the command, the sort of exact thing, the program you want to run. So in the case of uh, 
of Node. You did something like Node space, and then a path to a script. You wanted to run a path to a, a JavaScript running a file on a computer, on your computer. Um, and what you did there is you told node to run and you give it a parameter. And that first parameter was like the path of the script you wanted to run. And that was all you did. And it sort of node ran. And when it ran, it was like, oh, you, you gave me a thing to run it with. Okay, this parameter, and this is a path to a file. So I'll do all my thing and run that, that code. Netcat conceptually is very similar. It's a command you can run in the terminal. And when you run it, it has a couple parameters you can pass to it. Um, Let's talk about the client one first. It's a little bit more straightforward. The client one takes two parameters. The first parameter is the IP address to connect to. The second one is the port to connect to. So what Netcat does when it runs, it's sort of you type NC, you type the whole thing, you hit enter. The command runs and it looks at the parameters you pass it. And it says, OK, I've got two parameters. The first parameter, OK, cool. That's an IP address. Second parameter, oh, cool, that's the port. And then it will do the thing to sort of go through that whole workflow we talked about, go find the computer on the internet and, and then connect, make a connection to it with a TCP socket. So you have that connection open to the other, com, com, uh, excuse me, the other computer. And then you sort of can send data along that connection. And great, okay, cool. You're now able to sort of do it. We did the little demo we just did. Um, the server command, it's a little bit more complex. So the server command has a dash L in there. And you'll see this sort of syntax a lot in, in terminal commands. And this is what's called a flag or a named argument. Sometimes we're going to call it flag. Um, a flag is like a way you can sort of turn on a specific option. And flags always start with a dash and sometimes start with two dashes. Um, so usually it's a single dash if it's a one character flag and multiple dashes if it's a many character flag, whatever, it doesn't matter. In this case, it's a one character flag, so it's one dash. And what this does, dash L puts netcat into listen mode. And when netcat's in listen mode, it will listen for connections being made to it by any clients. And it will listen on a port 5678. So when, you're in, when netcat's in listen mode, it, it only requires one parameter. It requires a port. When it's not in listen mode, it's connecting as a client, and it requires an IP to connect to and a port to connect to. So those are sort of, that's sort of breaking down what, what's going on there with, with how those commands are structured. I realize this might be is, kind of new. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Is 5678 the port that's being connected to? Correct, yeah. That's the port. Okay. Um, and another question. Oh, Oh, go ahead. No, yo, go ahead, Snyder. That was all that. Okay, I was going to ask, how do you know what port number to input, if that makes any sense? Yeah, good question. So in this case, it really doesn't matter as long as the port's the same in both commands. So if I could jump over here. Um, also, I should, I should also mention, this is at the end of the instructions, but when you're done and you want to terminate it, you can hit Control-C and it'll stop it. You might already know that from working with Node. I'm not sure, but... Uh, if you hit Control-C, it'll, it'll stop your command. But uh, if I run this again, but let's say I replace 5678 with like something else, like 9000. So I do the exact same thing, only now I'm using port 9000. It still works. Because the port, sort of the channels it's communicating on are lined up. Where it won't work is if you do like 9000 with this one and like 5678 with this one. Because then they're not lined up and they're sort of not sending to each, they're not talking to each other on the same sort of channel or like the same sort of communication place. Okay. Better question. Is there like a threshold you can't go over that zero to 65,000? Yeah, the 65535 number. That's the threshold. Gotcha. Also, I, I should mention ports can't be negative. So it's like zero to 65535. But that's a lot of options. And mm -hmm. in yeah. practice, you never really use all those. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, what Mel typed in the in the chat is, I think, uh, app. So, NC options host port, and then also keep in mind though, like if it's in listen mode, you don't need a host. So it's these are really sort of the two kind of incantations of Netcat you're going to be using. These two sort of formats. Um, if you're curious and you look it up online, Netcat can do a lot more things. It's it's actually like a 
really kind of helpful tool. And part of my like under the covers reason why I'm showing you all this is because it's a really less known Unix tool that I really use a lot and it comes in handy. So maybe it's one of those things where if you get curious, you'll dive more into it and learn about all its superpowers. But don't worry about any of that now. Um, it's a, uh, for now, these are just sort of the two incantations we're going to use. Okay. Yeah, we just did that. Cool. We did that. And it worked for most, if not all of you. Um, our goal for the day has been complete, but we have more. So what if we wanted to talk to a machine instead of talking to ourselves or talking to another human? Like we want to talk to a computer. That's kind of like the whole point here. Like we were talking to ourselves, but you want to be able to like ask a computer for information. You want don't want to like ask a human for information directly, you know? Like that's the whole point of the, the internet, like machines talking to machines, you know, that whole thing. Um, well, if we're going to do that, we need what's called a protocol. Think of a protocol as like a language, the language you're writing your letter in. You need to have two people that understand the same language for them to be able to communicate. If I write my note in French and you don't speak French, you're not going to be able to understand what I said. You might kind of get some rough patterns. You might sort of get some things here and there, but you're not going to really get it. And the same things with the computer. If you type your message in, let's say, JavaScript, I mean, this is this is kind of an abstract example, but I think gets the point across. And your computer only knows how to run like Python, another programming language, then it's not going to be able to work. It needs to sort of understand how to under how to read that message. And they must agree. Like they they sort of there's like a list of protocols both things can understand. There's sort of an intersection of them that they both can understand. And those are sort of the protocols they can use to talk with each other. So for today. I've come up with a quite contrived protocol. And it's because I want to sort of demonstrate some, some things. This isn't a real protocol. This is like I was being like clever and came up with something. Um, but I think we'll, we'll get some points across. So this is a protocol we can use to ask a computer a question. And there are three different kinds of questions we can ask the computer. The first question we can ask the computer is one that follows the format, what is your favorite something? The second one is, how many somethings do you have? And the last one is, what something is it? And the way this sort of, the, this protocol is formatted is there's sort of two sections to it, kind of like the way Netcat sort of laid out. You have sort of a beginning bit, which is the identifier of the question you want to ask. One of these things here. And the second part is a word. And sort of like it's the word you want to send, sort of the, the, the word that goes under the blank in this question response or this, this prompt here. And if you send a message to the server, it'll sort of be able to understand this because it sort of understands these types of questions. It understands the, the words that go in there. And they can then respond. It can send a sort of come back with a response, which is sort of the identifier is ANS and then a word. And it's the answer is that word. So if I were to send the message, FAV programming language, then what the computer would understand that to mean is, what is your favorite programming language? Does this kind of make sense? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, let's see, who was? Mark? Who was it who just spoke there? That's me, Jennifer. Sorry, too many, uh, too many Zoom windows here. Um, what doesn't make sense to you about it? How uh, is, is there any questions you have that I can maybe answer? No, I, I think I just need to see it work for it to make sense to me. Cool. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm going to do an example of this. And then I think we're going to take our break. And then we're going to come back and we're going to do some more of this stuff. Because I think we're about at break time here. Mm -hmm. um, had I thought a bit more, I would have taken the break before we got into this. But whatever. Okay. So I've... Uh, I've written a server that can understand this protocol. And it is running on careersandcode.ml. So that's sort of the, the domain it's running on, the DNS name. And it's running on port 4000. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect to the server. We're going to ask it some questions, and it's going to give us some responses. 
And this is going to be cool because this isn't just like we're talking to ourselves. This is we're actually like talking to a real thing out there on the real internet. So hopefully this will be a little bit more insightful, fun, whatever. Uh, whatever pick, pick whichever one you want. Um, okay. So we're going to use Netcat again to do this. And again, I'm, I'm going to sort of run through this here real quick. Uh, you're welcome to try to follow along, but we're going to take our break right after this and sort of get back to it after the break. So I'm going to go back over into my terminal here. And I'm going to connect. So remember before, Netcat, I've got the two sort of versions. I've got the client version and the server version. The client version, it goes NC host port or NC domain name port. So I'm going to connect. I mean, I have both of those from before. Uh, host port. So I'm going to connect to that. I'm going to go NC careers in code.ml 4000. Hit enter. And it kind of does a thing. Okay. And then I'm going to ask it the question I asked here. So going back over to our protocol, I want to ask it, what is your favorite Apple? I don't know why I picked that. It's kind of a weird question. But uh, let's say I want to ask that question. Well, how does that sort of decode with this protocol? Well, under the, the three possible questions, FAV, MAN, IST, what is your favorite? That's the FAV one. And Apple sort of goes where the line is here. So sort of breaking this protocol down, I want to ask FAV Apple, what is your favorite Apple? So I'm going to send that. I'm going to type that. And also I should note all these question sort of identifiers are all capitalized. And that's important. It's case sensitive. You have to do all the spacing right, all that sort of stuff from before all matches. You have to do all that correctly. So if I type FAV Apple, and then I hit enter, I get back ANS Macintosh. ANS, the answer is, well, looks like the answer is Macintosh. The answer is Macintosh. There we go. So I just uh, communicated with a server out there on the internet. I asked it a question. It gave me back a response. All's good, I think. So uh, give it a try yourself, um, or if you want to wait until after the break, that's we can do that too. Um, actually, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's, uh, let's take the break now, just so uh, we can sort of get that through here and uh, maybe let you marry on this a little bit. And then uh, at about like 7.20 or so, we'll get back to this and sort of uh, try to work through this. And hopefully we can get everyone to talk to the server. Sounds good? Yep. Cool. Uh, we, we normally have like 20, 25 minute breaks. It's oh, okay. 20. So should it be the 20 or the 25? Or we can the 30? 20. We can come back at 725. That's why. <laughs> okay. Let's let's do the 25 because I want to get a little bit of stretch my legs a little bit here. All right. Cool. Okay. Be back then. Uh see you all soon. Thank you. Oh, whoever did that. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. I always forget that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to run NC careers and code.ml 4000. And what that's going to do is sort of it's the client version of Netcat. It's going to sort of connect to careers and code.ml 4000 on port 4000. I'm going to hit enter. It's going to sort of connect. So I've got sort of a server running out there already, sort of that I've already set up. That's, that's good to go on the careers and code.ml. And I'm going to ask it a question. So from before, I'm going to ask it FAV Apple. I'm going to come back, ANS Macintosh. And had our protocol over here. That's sort of how we're following that. Um, I'd suggest you don't have this presentation up and you want to sort of study this or the other slide. It might be helpful because I only show one at once here. Um, but uh, yeah. So I would like for everyone to try to recreate that on their end. And uh, if you have successfully, give me a, a thumbs up in Slack or let, let me know somehow. Uh, Artrell, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I tried it, but I'm getting the same message in my other terminal. Like what I type in oh. it populates the same on the other side. Do I need to like stop trying to communicate between the two terminals? Yeah, yeah. So if you hit control C, that'll terminate okay. Netcat. Or you can also quit your terminal and open up a new one. And, and the way you'll know it worked is when you hit control C, you'll get your little prompt back again. I did. I cool. got it back. All right, so I'll try it now.
it worked. Did you get mine? Right. Say that again. Ryan, did you get mine? Get yours? What do you mean, get yours? You can't see it on the server? Oh, no, I can't see. I don't, I'm not looking at the server right now, no. Oh, okay. All right, well, it worked. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so also I should mention, if you connect to it, you just type, like, random English, like, hello there. It's not going to be able to understand how that works. It's going to be like, I don't know what you're saying because you're not speaking its language. Mm. So if you have it up and you're working with it there, I give that a shot too, just so you can see that happen. And also, if you try to do like FAV uh, crazy thing, like it doesn't know, it only has so many questions it knows how to answer. So I guess I didn't spell it out in that document, but also there's an ERR. And that's what happens if there's an error. So I guess there's, there's two possible responses. You can either get back ANS the result or ERR, something went wrong, here's the problem. Cool. Um, let's do it this way. Has anyone not been able to uh, make communication with my web server out there? If not, let's chat about it. Let's figure it out. Uh, Schneider. Are you having some issues? No, I got a question. You said yeah. that you wrote this server? I did. So are we going to learn how to write a server? You are in a future module, unfortunately. But what I will tell uh, you to whet your appetite is I wrote it in Node. And what I effectively I'm... did is like when you ran like Node, like your command, you hit enter and it sort of like ran your JavaScript locally. That's what I did. That's what's running on my server. It's just I use some special tools so that it can effectively listen for network connections, for TCP connections. Mm. It reminds me um, sort of like so far I've seen some overlap when we were learning DevOps. Um, mm. And that kind of just reminds me when, um, when Nathan ran a script, I guess, and like he would keep track of our inputs. Yeah, I have to admit that I don't know what Nathan presented, um, but I probably should. And that that could very well be the case. <laughs> Is that a vague enough answer for you? Cool. Sweet. Well, I'm not seeing anyone having any difficulty, and uh, or maybe folks are just so lost they don't they're too far behind. What? Either way, um, it sounds like I should keep moving forward. Is anyone, uh, oh, I'm seeing lots of head shaking. Okay, I'm gonna go for it. Cool. So the way I've generally structured each of these lessons during this, this sort of whole section here, these two weeks, there's sort of a beginning section, which is sort of like the luxury thing. And there's the second section, which is sort of like the, uh, like some exercises. And in the past, the way I've done this when I've taught it is these exercises have been like homework. And they've been sort of like homework that started in class. Um, Max encouraged me this time to make them all classwork because in the past students have had issues with like having daily homework and that being a bit taxing, especially when sort of you have lots of other life commitments going on. So I, I totally understand where that's coming from. So we're gonna give this a shot here. We're gonna sort of go through all these together. Um, my hope is that you can sort of do them along with me slash kind of do them on your own. Um, and uh, it's just gonna be a lot more of these sort of questions we're asking the server. Um, you might've wondered, why do we have all these different types of questions if we've only used one? It's because there's a lot more coming. Um, so again, the, the server is running on careersandcode.ml port 4000. So first question is, what time is it? So I'm gonna give uh, a couple minutes. I think people seem to have been pretty successful at this. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes to try to ask the question to the server and get back a response. And maybe like in two minutes, I'll sort of jump in and I'll sort of give a demo of it and we can talk about it if it's not working for you. Sounds good? Cool. Um, I just did it and it gave me the time, but in a weird way. Yes, it puts, uh, it's probably like got a Z at the end, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, cool.
also I should mention if this is seeming relatively easy, that's kind of on purpose. Like it's going to start ramping up here. Um, also, like the way that I historically have structured this is like this has come right after JavaScript and people are very overwhelmed. So I tend to be like, let's give people a bit of a break to sort of digest. <laughs> so that's also where this is coming from too. But let's just say that like a couple days in, we're going to be writing some JavaScript again. So it's coming, but yeah. Cool. I'll give like maybe 30 more seconds here and then we'll jump into it. But it sounds like some folks have been having some success, which is good. Okay, so what time is it? So we've got sort of our three different possible questions. This kind of fits one of those patterns. What blank is it? So IST is our question identifier and our word is time. So if I go over here and I go IST time, okay, there we go. ANS, the time is this crazy thing. What's that thing? Someone asked that. Well, computers, when they deal with time, uh, or let me rephrase that, time is a very tricky concept generally. Now, as a layperson, you probably don't have like a good deep understanding of that unless you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And what I'll say is like, time is one of those things where for a computer, it's a system that for humans has been optimized for how humans work. Things like we have like these things called time zones and these this thing called like daylight savings time. And the crazy thing is that like time can be different for different people on the like different locations and different things like time zone offsets aren't constant. Like there's all these sort of crazy things. And there's this like, I mean, I, I got to dig this up, I guess, and I'll send it out in the, the channel afterwards. There's a great sort of... um like blog post where it's like 10 things you thought you knew about time, where it's like 10 things where it'll sort of be like, you think like X is true. And then the person's like, actually, no, in this weird, obscure part of the world, this is not true. Um, anyway, the reason why I'm going off on this thing about time is because the best sort of way computers have to keep time is sort of my picking one time zone and by assuming things like time always moves forward. That's a thing also. You think like time always moves forward. That's not the case. Um, and if you're thinking, when does that not happen? Um, daylight savings. Just a little, little aside here. There's a, another, like when you have a daylight savings event occur, um, an hour can be skipped. So you'll go from, I think it's like, like midnight to like 2 a.m. and you'll just skip 1 a.m. And on the other end, you'll repeat an hour twice. So if you're up like super late during the daylight savings transition, it will actually go, I believe, I might have this wrong, it'll go like to 1 a.m. and then, or it'll be like 12.59, 59, it'll go to, to 1 and it'll sort of go, I think, to two. And then right when it hits, right before it's going to hit two, it jumps back to one again, and it repeats the hour again. And it's because the daylight savings transition happened right then, and the shift, it shifted. So, like, time doesn't always move forward. Um, time also does ha sometimes happens more than once. There's, like, all these sort of crazy edge cases you have to think about. Why am I saying all this? Because the best way in computing we have to really keep track of time is UTC time. So sort of we, UTC time is sort of offset, daylight savings offset of zero. And it's sort of the GMT is kind of an old school term for, but GMT is a little different than UTC, whatever. Um, so the Z at the end of the time, traditionally in computing means it's in UTC. So right now it's actually tomorrow. It's uh, 
12.36 a.m. on the UTC, like at an UTC time. So you, you can, UTC time is approximately like UK time. Um, and I think that someone's going to watch this later and be like, you're so wrong about this. Because I'm, but like, I believe that the UK and UTC time always line up. Um, uh, actually, UK is five hours ahead. So yes, that's true. Yeah. If it was six hours, then it would be the rest of Europe. So the, yes. The reason why I forget if, if the UK has like a daylight savings concept or not. Um, whatever. I'm really going down a rabbit hole here, and I'm sorry, folks, but hopefully you've learned something out of my pontificating here. Um, anyway, though, that's why there's a Z at the end, because this, com this server is, it's actually running in New York City in a data center down there, but like it's, uh, typically data centers, all the servers are on UTC time. They're, that's the time zone offset they're set to, and you typically use UTC time because the other thing about it is it always moves in one direction. It's what's called monotonically increasing. So time always moves forward. You never have to play games like, does this time happen more than once? Um, it's a, uh, it's really important to have consistent time. And yeah, anyway, I spent way too much time talking about this. Um, okay, let's keep moving forward. <laughs> How many CPUs do you have? Give that a shot. I'll give you a minute or two here. My problem with this stuff is grammar. Like the first time around, I capitalized time. It didn't work. So I used lowercase time and it worked. Uh, I uh, used CPU and apostrophe. It didn't work. And then I put nothing like just CPUS and it works. So ugh, what? Yeah. So this is one of those things where like you really have to be very literal with the computer. Like it's it doesn't really understand context like it's like looking at it character by character instead of matching it against things. And if you're one character off, it's not going to be like lenient. It's either like right or it's wrong. Um, and unfortunately, like this is just one of those things where it just you're going to get better at it with time. And it's a lot of uh, a skill you start to get good at is being able to look at two bits of text and notice patterns and be able to tell where they're different. And it's like a it's a weird spidey sense. Like as like, I I can like look at this stuff and be like, oh, that's what's wrong. And it's 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 cool, but it just takes some time to develop it. So part of my goal with this is to sort of help develop that a little bit for you all as well. Um, but it's gonna be a little frustrating. Yeah, I'm already picking up on that stuff. It was just interesting. Fair enough. Yeah. I found the blog post, by the way, about time. I'm gonna post it. It's called uh falsehoods programmers believe about time um and it's it's excellent i'm chuckling here Cool though, I think we're probably ready to uh, to go through this. Um, let's let me let me ask this: Has anyone uh, not been able to complete this? And it's totally cool if you haven't. 
it's just if you haven't, I want to sort of uh, work through it because other people might be having problems. And I, I'd love to sort of figure it out. Cool. I'm not hearing anybody speaking up, which makes me makes that makes me confident that it's working for folks. So cool. this one, uh, how many CPUs do you have? So M A N CPUs. I have one CPU core. It's nice and grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, cool. Okay, got a few more here. Um, what is your favorite operating system? So again, is this the computer talking back to me or is this preset answers? These are preset answers. Like you can think of it like sort of a big like database I have of sort of questions and their corresponding answers. Gotcha. This is a little contrived, but also kind of not really. Like a, a thing that often you'll query computers for is like it ha maybe has like a big database of information and you sort of want to like have it look up information in that database. Um, this isn't that big of a database of information, but like it's it's other than the contrived nature of the questions, the actual task you're doing here is not too unusual. Okay, sweet. I think I'm going to go through this one here too. So uh, what is your favorite operating system? I imagine probably by this point, you're starting to get a hang of it a little bit. So FAV operating system, Linux, a good choice. Um, yeah, I've got a few more of these, but they're probably pretty repetitive. And if folks are starting to get this, it's, I don't know if keep doing this over and over is going to be much more helpful. Um, I've got two more here. I think I'm going to say that if uh, any of you are looking for sort of some more practice, feel free to do these on your own. But I get the feeling people are generally getting this stuff and doing two more of these wouldn't really add anything else. Um, cool. That's all I had for day one. Um, so unless anybody has any questions, uh, I think we might be able to end a little bit early today. Yes, I have my thing throughout this whole thing has been the ports. So is there like a set limit to how? Yeah, I don't know how to word this. So let's say um, we were on we're on this port, what, 4000 mm -hmm. and we're all on there. So is there like a set limit or it can? Ah, yes. You are poking a hole in the my house analogy. <laughs> so the thing that I didn't talk about is there's actually what's called incoming ports and outgoing ports. and Effectively, you are all connecting the same incoming port, but the computer all like is using different outgoing ports to connect back to you. So in effect, while you sort of are all connecting to the same port, you all have sort of independent channels within that port, if that makes sense. There, you've, you've uh, each socket, like each sort of bi-directional communication pipe between those two systems is sort of its own independent thing. And once those are those sort of open, like the, the port sort of acts as like where you go. But like once you sort of have that connected, that's like its own little thing that other things can't tap into. Does that make sense? So what if we had someone else's port? What do you mean by somebody else's port? Like uh, is this the basis for hacking? Like in a way? Uh... So the reason why that, like, I should be clear, you're all like asking good questions and you're going to start to poke holes in my analogy before. So I'm going to have to maybe start to, to dive down a few levels deeper. But if you're curious, cool. I guess I'm just saying this because if you're already sort of holding on by your fingernails, then you might not be able to understand this and that's fine. Um, this is sort of above and beyond. But like the reason why that doesn't work is when network requests are received, the server will validate them and make sure they're coming from the right place. 
So if the network request is coming from the wrong place, it sort of won't include that as part of that socket. Okay. Um, you might ask, how does it know it's coming from the right place? Because probably the way it would know is like the thing like is being, if you have in your message like a return address and it's like, I came from place X, what, why couldn't someone just like counterfeit that? And the answer is they could, but there are other technologies in play using some like sort of fancy encryption sort of stuff where you can sort of do things to make it so that you have like a shared secret that only that two parties know. And if they both know that secret, then they can sort of use it to encrypt their communication. And then mm. if you try to send data and you don't know that secret, it's just sort of it's like garbage and the computer is just like, I can't decode this and it throws it away. Okay. It's pretty dope. Thank you, though. Yeah. Yeah, all this stuff is, like, very cool. And it's it's the sort of thing where if, if what sort of, like, lights you up is being able to, like, see things work in front of you, networking is sort of interesting in that way, where you can, like, you can dive down from the level we're at now all the way down to, like, the literal currents going along a wire. And you can sort of like work your way up from that, like through every level. And there's like, there's this thing called the OSI networking model. That's sort of like all the different sort of abstraction layers of the networking. And there's typically seven layers. And we've sort of worked from layer seven, which is the very top. And this sort of the protocol we're using now, my contrived protocol is like a layer seven thing, all the way down to layer four, and that's TCP. And below layer four is like the more complex stuff, which is where some of this like, IP related things go on and, and all that. I think IP is layer three. Um, yeah, but like I didn't go into any of this because I frankly don't have a complete understanding of it in my head. Like below layer four, I sort of get a little touch and go. <laughs> so I didn't want to try to teach that. And also because it's not really all that applicable as a web developer. Cool. Any other questions anybody has? No, that was really easy to follow. Thank you. Sweet. Hopefully the rest of the lessons are that easy to follow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, cool. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, then I think we're done. And looking forward to see you all tomorrow. Um, I will say, uh, just as a reminder, open hacks on uh, Thursday. I'll be there in person, and I think Mel's going to be there in person too. And you should do everything you can to try to be there because I'd love to meet you in person. Oh, also, there's a woman in coding on Saturday. So if any of you want to attend, it's from 1230 till 3. I did post it on Slack over the weekend. So if you do want to come and attend, you're, please attend. What's I'm advertising topic? for it. What's the topic this time around? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. You got to give me a second to pull okay, it up. No problem. Just if you knew it, I was curious. It's more of like, a. It, there's really no topic. It doesn't say the topic. Um, uh, this is like Q and A session. Yeah, it's more of like a meetup, holidays, cookies, code, chat, oh. and networking. So nice. Sweet. Well, uh, thanks, folks, and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Right. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. Bye.